Bingo, we're back. We're here with Marianne Sasaki, and we're doing, uh, what are we doing? We do, we're having <laughs> He a said, she said, H-S-S-S. -S -S. Yes. <laughs> That's what we used to do in law school when we were unhappy. Marianne Sasaki is the lawyer down the street, and she's a regular host of Life in the Law, and she's a very important person for Think Tech, and she joins me every now and then, and we do this thing called well, actually, it's more frequent than that. I want it to be more frequent. I than wish that. it was more frequent than that, too. He said, she said, and we talk about things we agree on or not. And uh, frequently, they are things we're interested in. In this case, well, some uh, politics. Politics always, always politics. So we're talking about ruminations political. Yes, let's ruminate. Let's ruminate. What happened this weekend? What happened at it the was, polls? It was, it was the, um, the voting show, right? <laughs> as opposed to all the other shows we watch. <laughs> <laughs> it's just another show. Well, There's a blend, you know, a, a morphing between fact and fiction. This one was both. <laughs> both? So where was everybody, though, at the beach? Uh, you know, this is a really good question. They weren't voting. You know, that, uh, who said recently in the paper, the remarkable thing is that, is that they don't vote, but then everybody gets very interested watching the results of the voting. That's so strange. so bizarre. That's so opposite of the way it should be, right? Yeah. Right? And, and, you know, you really have no, you can't be disgruntled if you don't vote. No. You have, you, I mean, you can't, you can't say, I don't like the way things are going if you're not you participating. You walk down the street and ask people if they voted, and remarkably, so many of them, either they won't tell you, which means they didn't vote, or they'll tell you they didn't vote. They don't care. No. They're That's interested strange. in the result, but it's, it's a, as an observer, as a spectator. We get spectator government here, right? That's what we have. It's a show. Spectator citizenry. Well, you know, but I have a little, I think, I think Kirk Caldwell's going to pull out. 34 percent. I know. 34. That's lower than ever before. You know, and for months it's been the biggest news item on all the channels, all the news channels, all the regular channels, every day, the drumbeat of politics. And yet when, when you know, you, when you get to election day, now granted it's a primary election right. day, but still, you get to election day, 34% in this state. That is embarrassing. And really, what kind of a message does it send to the millennials, by the way, who didn't vote? No, they're, they're not really bad. big voters. You know, yeah. Here we, we sit every day, we talk about how they got to come in, come in from the cold, get, get, this is your time. It's their turn. You know, change from within and all that. And no, they don't come in. And it's worse than other states. It's worse than ever before. The trend is clear. We're not voting. What an awful situation. People have lost faith in the system, you think? Yeah. That's got to be what it is. Well, they're too busy. Too they're busy too be doing what? Too busy watching TV, watching the results of the voting, than to actually go out and vote. That's what. Well, the Olympics were on this weekend, too, so maybe that affected it. Yeah, it's it. old news already. I know. I don't watch the Olympics. <laughs> uh, you know, I, there's only like, I like two sports, like biathlon, you know, shooting and skiing. I think that's a very interesting yeah. uh, uh, sport and like shot put. So what about the mayor? I think Kurt Caldwell's going to pull it out. I really do. Even though despite all the uh, early uh, signs and all the portents and everything, I think he's going to win. Because now Carlisle's not in anymore, right? So, so Carlisle was drawing votes away. I think His so. His pro-rail, right. you know, drawing votes away from the other pro-rail. So now he's out. Right. What happened to Carlisle? What, what made him fail? I, I, well, I don't know if, what I don't know. Did he fail? I mean, I think I think anybody that has the nerve to run is, you know, what uh, clearly. What lose? But we, yeah, what? Well, he he only served one term, right? So I guess the people of Honolulu were not very affected by his leadership uh, qualities. I think find him very affecting. But um, yeah, you had him on the show. Didn't I you? had him on the show. I I like his politics. He's a little bit pro uh, law and order because you know he was the prosecuting attorney for me uh, you know i'm a little more uh, i know Frenchy, that every Frenchy everyone Gold, watching this knows granola that. than that she, she's <laughs> on she's on the left side of the left the left of the left <laughs> the, the french side um so i don't know you know i i think he's engaging but you know it also comes down to money that he didn't have any money either and i think Deju is very well funded Deju is better funded no than than uh Kirk Colwell. Yeah, I think so. But 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 doesn't he have money outside of donations? I mean, doesn't he have? I think I thought he had came from family money or something like Could that. Be. I just have. I just that's what I thought I heard Could that be. his father. He may have. He may have um, uh, support money coming from Republican uh, organizations on the mainland. You know, 
entirely possible. Really? Well, he's a Republican. Right. And he was, you know, connected with the Republican Party uh, during the lingual years, anyway. And so, although he went, you know, when he went to the city, he became non-denominational. Right, but right. I think he still has those old connections. Oh, I didn't know. Okay. And as and when he runs for, say, governor, you know, you'll see all that pop up again. Think he's going to run for governor too? Well, he might, but you know, it's going to be hard to beat David Ige right now. And it's going to be hard for him to run as Republican. Group Republicans have really, you know, pulled a rug out from under themselves. In well, general. in general, yes. But, well, this, this has been a very bad year. Republicans are going to remember this year very like they had a hangover for the whole year. Because nothing good, everything, they have, everything goes bad for you them. You talk everything. as if it's temporary. Well, I and mean... A lot of people feel it's permanent, that the, the party is permanently finished. You think? I don't, th I don't think so. I think, I think they'll recover, but I don't think they'll ever let any, like the barbarians like Donald Trump in the gates ever again. I think they'll, they'll, they'll uh, keep, a, keep, keep that pretty closed off, you know. So. so back to the mayor. So you say that Caldwell will win because, what, he has, he has a following, he's the incumbent. Right, and he's, I, he's more, I think... He's, he's very affable. Yeah, and he's more consistent with the uh, ideology of the people I think I you know I think that if you know it's it's a li it's a liberal town it's a it's a democratic town it's not a republican town you know it's not they don't want to squash everything you know people people want to see real maybe they don't want to see it to middle street maybe they want to see it a little further or whatever but um you know I, I agree with that I mean just in the course of anecdotal conversation I I find that most people say well doesn't matter how we got here. It was a torturous route, and you know, don't agree with it. But, but here we are. Yeah, we, we're These here. are our options. We right. have to pick reasonably, rationally, pick an option, right. and, and we're going to do tear it down. I can't tear. Can't it down. tear it down. It's can't already too forward. late. Yeah. You can't. You can't put that genie back in the bottle. Yeah. So you know. Yes, but I, I, I think he's affable. I don't think the Jew is so affable. Is that was that wrong to say? No, he's just not. Okay. He's not charming. He's. Do you find him charming? He's not charming. I do. I find him charming. You do. You yeah. really do. That doesn't rule the day for me, but I find him charming. Oh, that's interesting. I think he's a little bit. No, oh, he's very friendly. Maybe it's me. It's you. <laughs> it is you. Because you're J Five L. I know him for a long time. Well, that's you probably know him <laughs> since he's yeah. Right. Right. Okay. So, uh, yeah, I'm just talking about how, you know, I only have seen him on TV. I've never met him or whatever. So, I mean, you might be very charming, Mr. Jew, personally. But just well, I think he's more charming than Charles the Jew. Charles the Jew is a little bit standoffish. Oh, yes? Yeah. Uh, although, you know, he's got good policies and he's very Akamai about these things. And, uh, you know, if you go into, you know, if, you, if you're anti-rail, he's a pretty appealing candidate. Right. Um, so are you going to vote for him, being anti-rail? It's too late for that. I'm not telling you. Secret ballot. Read my lips. <laughs> you're so you're so opposed to it. Yeah, it's too late. You have to take the, a much more uh, Zen approach. It's here. Well, it's going to be here. It's going to affect you us. You want to talk about that for a minute? You sure. Know, digress to rail. I, I I I always like to talk about rail because well, I think it's a good idea. There was something about uh, Grabowskis and how he was going to be the next uh, sacrificial lamb. I think was the term, and I agree. I think he will be the. Sa oh yeah, Colleen Hanabusa is going to have him. And he's going to he's going to go the way of all sacrificial lambs. Uh, that doesn't solve the problem at all. No. The problem is a money problem, and uh, you know, and we we really spent too much already. Uh, we were extravagant in so many things we did. We could have made this whole project a lot How cheaper. How are they extravagant? Because I you know I only didn't have here. to be uh, you know raised rail. Didn't have to be this kind of rail. It could have been at grade. Would have been fine. Um, but you know we we had to we had to be. Um, Fancy. Like the city of the future? Yeah. I mean, is that what the, was it aesthetic concerns that made them? No, I think the, the more money you spend, uh, the more the workers get paid and put it together. You know? Really? That's so cynical. It is. You don't think that there was? My view? That's yeah. my view. Really? Yeah. I think. We, we were looking for excellence here. That's, that's not a thing we were looking for. But the, uh, the design is excellent, and I've seen the cars, and the cars are excellent. You can buy excellent cars anywhere. But, uh, you know, query, is this going to be an excellent system? I don't, you know, I think the, once the, people start... It starts with you, the root. <laughs> the, you can't, uh, you know, I, I think once people start using it, they'll... I, I, I got to imagine, at the beginning of other rail systems, people must have felt the same way. They must have felt, we don't need this, it's a tremendous amount of money, it's a tr tremendous incursion into our lives. And then you get used to it, you get, you, you get used to the benefits of riding around and not having to worry about your car and getting places quickly and... 
We have a long way to go before it reaches. Uh, I hope I live know. this long enough to ride on the rail. <laughs> Do we? Me too. I'm not kidding. It's, it's not. You know, there's going to be so many issues. I mean, Hawaii's not good at big projects. You know, this became clear in the in the case of the convention center, which was the 350 million dollar project, and and like so many issues, so many consternations, so many controversies. And the same thing with the medical school. There was, you know, a big argument about it. Uh, if, if, it's got, if it costs more than $100 million of taxpayer money, you can expect big arguments about it. Hawaii, the land of protest. And, and so, you know, the, no surprise here. This is the biggest one of all. I don't think people realize how big it is. It's uh, big. It's, it's big. I mean, it's just, What's it at now? Oh, how much they spend already? Yeah. Oh, I don't know. Probably less than $5 billion, but they got a long way That's to go. That's a lot of money. That's a lot, a lot of money, yeah. So, uh, you know, what's going to happen with it? I, I would say it's going to take a long time. There'll be a lot of distraction. Um, I would say there'll be cost overruns to beat the band. It'll be 10, 12 or more billion dollars. Don't you uh, think they should just tax the rich and get it built? There you go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, remember, the, the rich it, are the ones who it, get the campaign isn't that? Isn't that, don't you think that would be a <laughs> terrific idea? If you made over a certain amount right, of money, not, you should yeah, yeah. contribute some, well, some extra to the, to the rail because, because of civic pride? You know what's going to happen? The people, the people who don't have a lot of money, who are on the, you know, the, the disadvantaged side of the disparity equation, they're going to ride the rail. Right, but so are other people. You don't believe me that other people. In New York, everybody well, does in it. In Hawaii, there's a, the thing called, I call the blush. The blush is if it's new, if it's just opened its doors, everybody has to go see it. Right. Everybody has to be there for a right. while. Right. And then the blush wears off. And then it's, you know, it's, it's, it's nothing. I think it and really depends on how, where it goes and how extensive it is. If, I mean, students would definitely use it if it went to the college. Um, I think millennials are prone to use it because they're, they, they're not even buying cars. They're riding bicycles. They don't even, are not even interested in car culture. So I found that an, an interesting little fact about the millennials. You know what? They're resistant to credit cards. They don't use credit cards, which is sort of somehow consistent with riding a bicycle. They don't have money. Well, they don't have money, but they also don't want to get even more enmeshed in the credit system, more enmeshed in student loans and stuff like that. How do they, how do they actually spend cash? I guess so. I, I, I think there'll be something on their phones coming up soon, you know. Oh, well, there is. Like in you China, can, you know, there'll be pay ways. With quick pay with your phone. Quick pay with your phone. You so swipe we don't it against need a credit the thing. card for that. Right, right. That's not credit, but that comes out of their bank account. But, I mean, they're unwilling to buy, like, big cars and um, large, as their parents did, large investments like appliances and things like that. They... They, they're not doing it, and it's, hurt, it's hurting the credit industry. The credit industry really, really wants these people, like, badly. Well, yeah. But, you know, I mean, the thing about it is that they're, they're in, a, in a generation where it's hard to get a job that will support an extravagant lifestyle. Well, right. Um, and and they, you introduced me to this. It's the, what do you call it, the, uh, the gig economy. The gig oh, economy. the gig economy. It's, uh, you know, know. And everybody thinks, oh, that's great. That's freedom. But right. in fact, you make a lot less money. It's insecurity. And the employer, so you know, pays a lot less to get the same work done. So it's, it's really a matter of efficiency rather than, you know, it's making not, a lot of It's not of a money. personal, uh, pe it's not, it, it's not a, the best personal choice. I mean, people do it because they have to do it because they need a job. But, I mean, I think people would like benefits. I think people would like sick days and holidays and, and help me medical benefits rather than, you know, driving around for Uber and... You know, well, Uber, they give you a paycheck. I don't know if they have benefits, but, you know, everything is contractual now. That's Certain amounts of It's the way time. the world is going. It's the way the world... And in, in a funny way, it's more efficient. But, but I think it, it's, it, it requires, you know, flexibility and a change. And it's happening. If you well, look around, you see it's happening. And you know what else is happening? What? A break. A oh. break is happening. Watch this. Boop. Aloha. I'm Carl Campagna. I hope you please visit us this summer. It's a wonderful summer. It's actually a cooler summer than we're used to. But I hope that you come back and visit us and watch our show, Education, Movers, Shakers, and Reformers, here on Think Tech Hawaii. It's at noon every Wednesday. See you then. Hi, my name is Kim Lau, and I'm the host of Hawaii Rising. You can watch me live every other Monday at 4 p.m. Aloha. Aloha. 
I'm State Senator Russell Ruderman. I represent the Pune and Kau District on the Big Island and the host of Ruderman Roundtable. We're here on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 2 p.m. You can join us at thinktechhawaii.com. You can find a link there to, uh, to a page where you can see past episodes. And we talk here about good government, environmental issues, and issues of the day facing the state of Hawaii. I'm Russell Ruderman. Please join us for the Ruderman Roundtable. Mahalo. So. Okay, we're back with, uh, you know, uh, 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 with, uh, what do you call it? What do you call the show again? He, he said, said, she, she said, said, and Jake, And we're talking you, okay. about political um, uh, ruminations, ruminations or ruminations political. And now we get to my favorite part of the show. That's what I was going to ask you. Pretty, pretty, my pretty favorite part, too. common thing, you know. <laughs> we, we can't help but doing the Trump report. What? It, right, it is. <laughs> it's the, the Trump daily report. Trump report. We bring you the daily Trump report in which uh, immigrants, well, this is the fight from the... Stripped from the pages of the New York Times, immigrants are going to face heightened scrutiny for coming into the country, which I don't even know what that means. I mean, it, it has, it really has a really negative specter, like, you know, like we're going to, we're going to do something to you before you come in and make you take these tests or what, I don't know what heightened scrutiny means. And then he, Donald Trump also has a little problem of his former campaign manager getting payments from Russia which is put a little thorn in his little in his side. And should we talk about the polls in which he's tanking <laughs> miserably? Just I don't know. There's so much here. I know. I Just, know. Let's go stream of conscious as we always do. Go ahead. Apparently, Donald Trump is reacting very badly to his drop in the polls. And he says that if he uh, doesn't win Pennsylvania, which he's like 10 points behind in Pennsylvania now, that uh, it will have been rigged, that you could be sure that something, something shady had gone on. That there were, he's, he's hiring, um, what are those things, poll checkers? You know, those people who check the polls to make sure the vote is honest? He doesn't have any ground. He has no people knocking on your door. He has nobody like that, but he's... But he's hiring poll checkers. Creating suspicion. Yes, exactly. Where there is none. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, I mean it, 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 it he he really is gonna undermine the system if it if if it benefits him at all. It will benefit him because the only way for him to retain his credibility is to discredit the system, right? Yeah. And so the whole thing is rigged. If he doesn't win it's not his fault. He is the winning candidate no matter what. But you know the funny thing is is it was rigged, but the Democrats rigged it. I mean there was an argument to be made for rigging, right? I mean, something happened in, what, Nevada with Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Hillary Clinton, and we know something. And so it's funny, he's taking that trope and he's sort of bending that trope for his own benefit. It's just terrible. But he came up with, within the last 24 hours, that he wants to... He wants to stop doing diplomacy around the world with our customary friends. He wants to focus our foreign policy on crushing ISIS. That's what he wants you to do. You mean the, the group founded by President Obama, that ISIS? And he blames, he, he blames <laughs> and President Obama. And co-founded Hillary, Hillary Clinton? Uh, right, co-founded, <laughs> right, exactly. And oh, the very fault, same one, huh? All their fault, and he's going to go out and crush them, and that's job one. The, but you know the, the greatest thing about him saying that they founded uh, ISIS was that there was this conservative talk show host who tried to give him an out and said, well, we understand you don't mean that they actually founded it. You mean that they set up a circumstance of world geopolitics so that, you know, they could have, and, he, and Trump was adamant. He's like, no, they founded it. Nope, founded it. They founded it. They founded ISIS. And I thought, wow. That's what I call loose thinking. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, I mean, and everybody says, they, I mean, the Democrats come back on it as he doesn't think properly. He's not qualified either by knowledge or by, you know, aptitude. Uh, to be president. John Oliver said something funny about him last night. John Oliver said, you know, there's this, um, there's this game, like a pr sort of prisoner's dilemma game, where one person always tells the truth and one person always lies, and you sort of have to figure out which one. The and he said that Donald Tr Trump is the person, is the those two people, but in one person. He always tells the truth and he always lies at the same time. <laughs> to neutralize us. <laughs> it's kind of funny. But, you know, when he comes up with this stuff, we have to, you know, redirect our efforts to crushing ISIS. Most important thing is, you know, they're a threat, and we have to go out there and spend every dollar and take every step, crush them. There's a lot of people who buy into that. A lot of people who buy into that. I don't think this they're crushable. Not, it's not a dumb 
you know, position to take. It's, and this reinforces his relationship with all those people who think that's job number right, one. Right, right. You know, it's funny. I lived through the biggest terrorist attack in, in, in the United States, right? I was in New York, and I lived blocks away from the World Trade Center. And sometimes when I see people in, in mid-America just absolutely terrified of terrorism, and ter 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 we... We had it at our step, footsteps, and we, we knew that it was an anomaly, and it's just a matter of, you know, statistics or whatever. But people are terrified that terrorism is going gonna, is gonna to just explode like down. And every a episode of violence isn't terrorism, just because you have some nut with a gun who says that ISIS, like, sent him messages that he should do this. That doesn't, that's not an act of terror. You know, they're not... They're not they're not that good, you know. So even in 9-11, we said, you know, there, it was so much more successful than they, they expected it to be. Well, they it was were just, surprised. Yes, they were surprised. That's right. And I think any time one of these big terrorist attacks goes off, they, they're, like, surprised, actually. Yeah. yeah. You know, the interesting thing, too, is we have, I mean, I think most people have learned to live with this rather than react to it all the time. Like Israel. I wish the press would learn that. Like Israel. Right. Good example. You live with it. You do what you have to do. Right, you, you live your you life. You protect yourself. You do the best job you can, you know, to avoid, avoid being hurt and killed. Um, and, you know, in a funny way, the world is still better than it was in 1920. You know, you know in 1920, people died from diseases. I was going to say penicillin, right? Isn't that right? one something? Before <laughs> penicillin, right? They died from a million causes, right, from and the numbers were staggering. And they had, you know, outbreaks of this and that, and, you know, a lot of people would die. Hundreds of thousands of people back in World War One. I, I mean, from disease yeah, here yo, in this country. Absolutely. Yellow fever. I don't, I oh, yeah, and the was. infant mortality rate. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's not, it's not, the world is not coming apart, and this is just another risk, and we have avoided some risks that we had in the past. Now we have this risk. So, I mean, it's a philosophical thing, but at the end of the day, um, we learn to deal with it. I think, I agree with you. I think the world is a better place. I mean, I think there's, People ignore the advances, like like in science and uh, other areas that we're making. Uh, like even okay, the racial situation in the United States is is very complicated. But I do think we're making advances. We're making advances with respect to people that are not like ourselves. We're we're learning. We're growing. So I, I agree with you. I mean, I don't think. Uh, you know, it's Donald Trump who says this is, these are the last days. Did you, you saw a speech during the Republican convention? A lot of people feel that way. He's, he's trying to get resonance with them. And, and some of them are going to agree, but I don't think they're the enlightened ones yet. So in terms of the world change, you know, I firmly believe the world is changing. It's got to be changing mm -hmm. in a time when the, everything's coming together by telecommunications and, you know, information and all that. And uh, it's changing in everywhere. It's changing everywhere because people in places that don't know about stuff, they are learning about yeah, stuff. Yeah, you can get uh, almost any information anywhere. And, uh, and that changes the way you do business, the way your community works. Right. And, and it rises you, it raises you up. So I, I want to tell you about Diffret, D-I-F-R-E-T. -E it's, uh, it's a movie made, produced actually, maybe directed too, by Angel Angelina Jolie, who is a very... Uh, well, come and good kind of person. Yes. She's really inspired, visionary person. And it goes way beyond her good looks and her acting. It's No, she's, she's a humanitarian. A, she's a big humanitarian, and she keeps on doing this stuff. And as we all know, making movies reaches a lot of people. Mm -hmm. The Fret is a movie that should reach And it's got great reviews, you know. And it's about a, a young 14-year-old girl in a small town not too far from Addis Ababa in Ethiopia mm -hmm. uh, who is um, subjected to... Um, marriage by kidnapping, which, oh. is, which is what they have done there. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's, a, there's a woman who is her lawyer in a women's lawyer organization. You'd love to work for this one. Uh, who, you know, they protect women. And right. They, they, this is one big, big issue for them. And um, they defended her against all odds, and they, they broke the back of that custom. Uh, and it's the story of the, the, this 14-year-old this girl, how, how she became the symbol of changing that custom. That sounds terrific. So it sounds like Ethiopia is in a better place because of this real live case. This is about a real live case. Right, right. And so it's just heartening. It's heartening in the sense that things are happening positively. Um, women's rights, for example. Right. I mean, would this happen without, without learning about how it happens in other places? Would this happen about, yeah. without learning about the fact that lawyers can go out and represent causes? Right. And, and women lawyers can represent right. women's causes right. if they want. 
So I mean, well, I think there's few places on earth that are worse than there were with respect to uh, individual rights like women's rights, but there are many places that are better. I mean, not, and that's not to say there aren't horrible places like Saudi Arabia or Qatar or where, where women have no rights, certain places in India. But I think generally there's been an, uh, uh, an uplift of, of uh, women's rights. I mean, yeah, and it has to do with knowing how the rest president. of the world lives. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we live in we live in times that are that are becoming, you know, better. You know, I wanted to make a point about um, ISIS too. Uh, you remember during the Vietnam War, and one of the reasons we failed so miserably in the Vietnam War was because it was a guerrilla war, right? And these were passionate guerrilla. They were. It wasn't a, a you know an army a the, a theater. Uh, uh, you know kind of war, is a jungle war. ISIS is merely that type of war, that type of guerrilla war, writ large, globally. And so it's not even new. I mean, there have always been uh, maniacs or, no, I shouldn't say maniacs, pa passionate people willing to defend their, against the ones, we would, the United States were people like that who, who Go against England? No. So, you know, the, the, this is not a new it's concept. It's the writ large thing that I think is absolutely Yes, the right writ large on. is new. It's not small. That's, that's it's why not it feels pervasive. Right. It's not in Vietnam. Right. It has an effect everywhere, and it can happen. That's why everywhere. people bite their nails and are worried. That's that, why they worry. Yeah, that's yeah. why they like Donald Trump, because he's going to put a, an end to all of that. But it's not. You, you can't know, put it into that. It take us back to a time when that did not happen. You know, Vietnam taught us that too. Vietnam taught us that you you kind of can't be to like a passionate enemy. You can't crush them not with normal uh, military strategies. So, what's anyway. the secret? How do you deal with this? I'm making I presidential think, I think candidate. I, I don't know. I think e education. I really do. I think in uh, with the right kind of education. You know, Thomas Friedman, who I by the way loathe, said did say. Did you say love or loathe? Loathe. Loathe. Thank you. Um, I love, love, love. Do you him. love yeah, him? Yeah, yeah. Well, okay. he's reductionist, though. He's so reductionist. But anyway, but he made it... Don't, you don't want to be reductionist in this life. No, Never no. Mind. Whatever no. that is. Um, but he made this argument uh, in, what, the Lexus and the Olive Tree, that, you know, every place that has a McDonald's or every place that has some form of Western culture, like, ultimately becomes a more open place, you know, and, and that you, if it, it's when it's closed that you can actually, like, foster this kind of uh, foment, you know, this kind of political foment. So I think it's that. I think, like, we should go back to, you know, sending money, you know, Peace Corps, every, you name it, and f and go in there and, and Absolutely. educate people. Absolutely, I agree with you a thousand percent. And yes, you know, for a while it might be dangerous, but after a while, I think we'll have a salutary effect everywhere. It's more powerful. Yeah. It's more powerful to change a person's mind than to crush their body. Yeah. Well, I just made that up. Doesn't that sound profound? Good. I like that. I like that. <laughs> it, and it applies. So it's, it's, a, it's the ultimate soft power is what it is. It's, yeah. we're, we're selling decency. How can you not buy decency? Right, right. And, you know, it's funny. People say that, like, um, in Iraq, they, they, we tried to make it a democratic state, and they resisted that. We don't have to make people exactly in our image. We just have to bring that, certain values People right. might not want to be a democracy and like the United States. they don't have to buy States. all the values. No. Just some of just them the, is okay. Right. Just the values that you're, gonna, you're entitled to, to life, liberty, pursuit of happiness. If and you, that includes if, women. If you, yes. If you start with that and, and all the people in the world who don't have that are, be, begin to feel that, I think you're making I a huge change. I think it's going to change the Middle East. It is changing the Middle East. You know, where a few years ago women's rights were really not possible, right. not discussed, not happening, right. and not even in the future. Now, right. the issue has been raised, and everyone knows that's an issue there, and they would be better off if they could, you know, take the mantle of the Taliban off, you know, and be regular right. people. Right. And I think it may not, it might not express itself right away, but soon enough, I think knowledge eventually. of how it works on the other side will permeate their world, right. and they will raise themselves up. I think so. Yeah. Either that we... Or we march in and kick their ass. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you, Mr. Trump. So that's the Trump report. You might have thought we were going left and right on that, and we were. We were, but it, it's, it's, well, it's well, like he it, said, she said. Yeah. Well, you know, he, he's so he. I he, I just don't think he understands the magnitude of of the problem and how fundamental it is to people 
to people's lives. It's not, it's not a war. It's not a war war. You know, we're not fighting a war war. So the question is whether the American voter is perfectible or not perfectible. This is a test of, of you know, how you can feel about the American voter and thus the American democracy. Okay, oh, it's, it's now 10 weeks away and we're going to see what happens. I, I, my prediction, continuing to plummet in the polls. I don't think he, I, don't, I think he's in a, a death spiral. My prediction is don't be so sure. Really? He's going to think of something. You he's think? a smart guy. He knows about this. He's going to figure out a way. He's going to go down fighting, but he's going to go down. Yeah, he's going to go down. <laughs> That's He Said, She Said. Marianne Sasaki and me, Jay Fidel, doing our thing every couple weeks or so. Yeah. Just trying to explore anything that comes to mind. We'll be right. We'll be back soon. Bye -bye.